This is Including You, the new series from Lead at Any Level. Including You features stories from chief diversity officers and other executives who are creating inclusive cultures in their organizations. Our goal is to show what's working in companies just like yours, to give you the tools you need to keep pushing for progress in your own workplace. We want to create belonging and opportunity for everyone, including you. And now here's your host, Amy C. Wanninger. Welcome back to Including You. I'm your host, Amy C. Wanninger, the Inclusion Catalyst. My guest today is Dr. Suzanne Wertheim. She's the CEO of Worthwhile Research and Consulting, which applies social science to anti-bias training and consulting. Dr. Wertheim is also the author of the new Inclusive Language Field Guide. Dr. Wertheim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. And from this point on, please just call me Suzanne. You betcha. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I am excited to talk to you. I love talking to fellow authors and fellow practitioners. And I want to just give people a little bit of a sense of who you are and how you came to write this book, and which also feeds into the work that you do in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. So can you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to write this book? Sure. My origin story is actually pretty easy in some respects, because I used to be a professor of a field called linguistic anthropology, which we've done the worst job of PR. So no one's ever heard of what we do. And they're like, wait, what do you do? But for decades, I was working on studying the interaction of language, power, and culture. And then I found that so many students were, there were so many concepts that were so sticky and students were applying them in the workplace that they would email me years later and be like, hey, Dr. Wertheim, this is still really useful, that I thought it felt so unfair that if you weren't attending an elite university, like the kind I taught in, or if you weren't uh, taking the kinds of classes that I taught, you were being denied the information that was so useful that you could start applying right away in the workplace. So in 2011, I left the university system. I found it worthwhile. And I started bringing things out from behind academic doors. And it turns out one of the best things that now that there's this interest in particular in something people call inclusive language, I've been looking at principles of human behavior and what takes interactions off rails and what keeps interactions going well. I've been looking at that for more than two decades. So it was a very natural progression into doing inclusive language work for my clients and then writing the book. And I don't want to take us too far off task, but I find this topic fascinating because there is so much culture embedded in the language. And I'm learning not just about being more inclusive, but about being less violent in the words and phrasing that we use in business contexts. And it, it's really incredible to me how much of the English language or the American vernacular is tied up in metaphors around war and oppression, that that's all just baked into our everyday conversation. So I'm sure doing this book brought up a lot of that as well. For me, I'll tell you my biggest challenge and the thing that permeates my language the most is using mental health terms very loosely, uh, in particular as what's called an intensifier. So it means there's this human urge to make things punchy and intense. And so we go through a lot of intensifiers. So we used to say things like, just really and very are, are very plain, but we say things like horribly or terribly or awfully, especially if we're British. But the language of horror and terror and awe has been removed from that. And so we're always looking for something punchier and mental health terms really fill the bill. And the problem is that when we use them loosely, it can be very painful. We never know who is struggling with a mental health issue, who has maybe lost someone because of mental health issues, who's dealing with depression or who isn't able to get a diagnosis because the ways that we loosely talk about mental health are masking what the actual symptoms of their problem is. So for me, this is the thing that like much ableist language, our language is so permeated with crazy, insane, psycho, OCD. There's so many ways that it comes in. And even I, as a practitioner, have to catch my tongue all the time. And I don't have great substitutions, even though I try to come up with some to suggest to people at the end of my book, I'm like, oh, if you're always saying crazy, how about saying this? But they don't always have that same taste in my mouth. And so sometimes that taste is hurting other people. So that's what I want to get rid of. But sometimes the taste is, hey, this is really out there. And I think we're going to have to work collectively to replace that language with something less harmful. But it's a challenge because it really permeates. 
It does. And I'm guessing because you brought that up that I probably used one of those words in my intro. I don't think you did. Sometimes I catch myself using using ableist terminology and I try really hard not to. I'll have to go back through the transcript and see if I slipped up. No, in no way a corrective, literally just something that's top of mind for me right now because of stuff I said to people last night at an event. And as it was coming out of my mouth, I'm like, nope, let me walk that back. Nope, let me walk that back. It just comes on out because so much of our language is autopilot and we're trained in these patterns that reflect an older standard. So the thing that's so interesting to me about language and has been for a long time is that our brains are so complicated that we can have conscious thoughts and then act in ways that are in contradiction to those thoughts. So for example, around gender, I I think almost everybody that I know, or most people I know have this conscious thought, yeah, all genders are equal. Everybody can do everything, everybody, or even if we do things a little differently, like no, nothing's better than, no one gender is better than another gender. But our language patterns consistently reflect a different story. Our language patterns say things like male people talk and female people listen, or male people are allowed to speak authoritatively and dissent, but female people, if they do it, they get pushback and they're called aggressive or abrasive or bossy or male people are allowed to have whatever facial expression that they want to have. And female people have to be doing emotional labor with our faces all the time. And if we don't, then we're told we look angry or we have resting bitch face. Or there are so many ways that our language patterns are giving different messages that are in contradiction. And so I think that's a thing that's so interesting and maybe fun, I don't want to overstate it. Fun for me about inclusive language, but when people see patterns that were hidden, when I'm like, oh, I'm an expert in pattern recognition, here's a pattern you might not have seen before, and they see it, they're like, oh, that's not a pattern that I'm aligned with. I I think it's a lot like when videos and photos became a lot more common, which has been in my lifetime. I think a lot of us thought that our posture was one way and it was a different way. So a lot of us think, oh, I'm walking around standing tall or sitting tall. And um, then the videos, the photo and video evidence is, oh, heck no, you are. And so I think it's a very similar thing with our language. We're like, oh, I'm saying language that's polite and respectful and I'm not hurting people because I know that I have these good intentions, but we're doing the equivalent of that slump over and bad posture with our language patterns. That is very true. And you said something interesting in there about being respectful with our language. And I want to put a point on this, if I may, because not as much recently, I think that the political discourse has changed and gotten a little uglier, if you will. But prior to the most recent sort of turmoil in our political landscape and our social landscape, there was a lot of pushback around being quote unquote politically correct. And if you did walk back your own language or try to approach something a different way or gently nudge someone into a different phrasing, they would say, oh, I don't have time for all this political correctness. And I always challenge people to think of instead of political correctness, respect. Because we would never tell someone, you're taking too much time to be respectful, or you treated that person with too much respect. They would look at you, you know, you would look at them, you would be appalled if someone said you were giving someone too much respect, but it's easy to brush something off as being too politically correct. And I'm wondering, do you find that same pushback now in your work since you're very focused on this? A hundred percent. So I try to, so the book is designed for multiple audiences at the same time. It was very complicated to write. So it's both meant to be useful for anti-bias practitioners, whatever letters people are using. I'm fine with all of them. I like all of them, but they change so much that I'm just saying anti-bias. Plus also people can be like, oh, inclusion's a nice to have, but it's hard for people to say I'm pro-bias. I'm always like anti-bias. I'm like, how can I manipulate things from a semantic framing perspective? And so saying anti-bias is one of those things. So I frame it in the book as, so it's both giving DEIB practitioners a helping hand with things that I have found land well, explanatory frameworks, principles, ways of naming something that land well with executives in particular that I've worked with, or with people who are coming from a place of not having a lot of knowledge about the frameworks that you and I know a lot about and principles and ways of slice and dicing the world and understanding patterns. So in the book, I talk about this as modern etiquette. And so I, we, we were talking, I was at an event last night at the time we were recording this. I was at an event last night where we were talking about 
the pushback from a lot of CEOs and executive teams that I don't have time for this. I'm building a startup. I don't have time for this. And so what do you do, for example, if people are mispronouncing names or using incorrect pronouns? And I said, I think one thing to say is they sound very unmodern and behind the times. So I'm sitting here in the Bay Area, which is very tech centered. And so nobody wants to seem unmodern, but I'm like, this is just 21st century etiquette. What's the difference between 21st century etiquette and the etiquette that I grew up with? It used to be that we were able to be disrespectful of a race, marginalize, ignore all kinds of people. And now we're like, oh, that wasn't good. So the only difference between today's etiquette and the old etiquette is some of us have to put in a little more effort to be respectful to the people we were taught when we were younger, it was okay to ignore or be disrespectful to. So I'm finding that the unmodern framing and the etiquette framing are landing well with people. And the other thing I'll say is that in terms of PC, I also have a thing in the book where I have an anecdote where a client of mine who is a, a VP of DEI at a more conservative kind of company, more financially oriented and a more conservative culture, reached out and said, so she had a personal connection to disability. So one of her first things was, let's be using as good a terminology as possible when it comes to disability. And she was getting pushed back and people were like, I don't have time for these new words. It's just PC. It's just, it, it's whimsical. People are making this up. It changes so fast. Can't people make up their mind? She said, I don't know what to tell them. I'm like, oh, I got a story for you. And it's the story of semantic shift and a thing that's called pejoration where if you use regular words as insults, eventually they become insulting. So I, I used to teach historical linguistics. And so this is the thing I'm talking about where I'm like, oh, I got a concept you can go and bring up. And so I'm like, if you say we're dealing with semantic shift, this word is no longer a scientific or technical or neutral term. It's now insulting. So if you're saying this word, you are insulting people. So we have to shift to the word. And until our cultural attitudes change about disability, if we, until we stop talking about disability as it's as if it's the most stigmatized identity, unless we stop giving this negative flavor to words about disability, you're going to have to learn new words in the future because guess what? That downhill slide is just going to happen again. So I'm finding that this is one of the benefits of bringing in the science that almost nobody knows about because again, we've done the worst job of PR is I can hand people science and say, no, this is a scientific fact. You think you're saying a regular word, but it's an insult and you don't want to be insulting. So you got to switch it up. One of the examples I use is the retro noun. So I'll ask, okay, what's that on your wall over there? Oh, that's a landline phone. Okay. But when you installed it, you didn't call it a landline phone. You called it a phone. So you've learned how to evolve your language so that people understand your intent with your telephone and your cell phone and your landline phone and your rotary dial phone and whatever. But it's the same effort, just applied differently to show respect for people. So I, I am totally with you and I love having another tool in the toolbox. Thank you for that. And it's so nice that you brought up retronym because I did a piece a few months ago about cisgender because somebody came to me and said, a bunch of people, I'm like, they're like, transgender makes sense, but cisgender, it feels so weird. And why do I have to be cisgender? And am I just not a regular person? And so I would, I exactly use the retronym. And I'm like, the thing is that we use trans a lot in English. So we have this sort of gut reaction to, I know what trans is. It means moving across. I'm like, cis is actually used a lot too, but it's in really more niche science. So you're not used to it. I'm like, but if you say a uh, digital watch or analog watch, if you say acoustic guitar, you can say cisgender. It's the same thing because now that we have this understanding, it's not a technological invention, but it's a better scientific understanding of the world. You got to use the retronym. So if you're willing to say acoustic guitar, I need you to say cisgender. So I'm so excited to hear other people are doing it too. It, I think it's the best. It's the cleanest explanation because you're, you're already doing it. You're already doing it. Exactly. Exactly. The same thing with name changes. Oh, they were Bob and now they're Barb. I had a maiden name and now I have a married name. No one has a problem with that. Let's move forward. So uh, there's so many examples like this. And, I, and I'm so grateful for the book. The book is called The Inclusive Language Field Guide for those who didn't catch it at the beginning. I, I'm so grateful for the book. I want to talk a little bit also about your consulting work. And when folks call you in for consulting, for anti-bias training, rooted in social science, they probably don't come saying, we really need anti-bias training rooted in social science. They probably have a much different problem statement in mind. Can you tell me just a little bit about what is it that they come to you with 
what is it that they're hoping to achieve and why does it matter to them? So I do actually get some people coming to me because of the social science, because I get a lot of word of mouth referrals and people will bring me in after a badly done training has gone off the rails and made people feel unsafe or bad or angry or attacked or blamed or shamed. So I've heard a lot of horror stories about training. I'm like, that's not a well-designed training. So actually what's funny is people are like, oh, I heard you're really scientific. Can you come in? So ironically, that is something that has brought me in. And I used to be in tech before I got a PhD and I was so dismissed and so underestimated and so condescended to, because you can't tell, but I'm very short. For those of you listening, I am ambiguously ethnic. I've got tan skin and brown hair and brown eyes. People, I have a list of 115 things people 115 things people think I am, you know, and almost never are they actually correct. And, and so people didn't know where to put me in there. And I was like, I, how can I get men in tech to listen to me? And I'm like, I literally got a PhD. I was like, I have a brain and I want to apply it to stuff. So I think it is funny that the credentialing, especially in the tech ecosystem that I'm so in, I, I work with also non-tech companies, but in the tech ecosystem, the credentialing actually has been a good, a good way for me to get into companies. But otherwise I do have every training that I have has a question that it's answering. So the two big questions that people come to me with are, how can I get people to talk about bias at work in a way that doesn't piss people off or make people feel bad? So I've got a three-part series. I just finished it up for a global tech company last night. I was running a thing from 9 to 11 p.m. for people. And I, I, I won't, they're like, can you do it till midnight? I'm like, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. But because I work with principles of human behavior and the way that I talk about bias and analyze bias is not starting from the framework of identity, which can be very US based. So if you've got a global company and you've got US based things and everything, for example, there's nothing wrong with front loading race in the US, like nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with it. But if you're, if you've got satellite offices in places where race, like Turkey or India, where race isn't the main organizing principle for bias. There's bias aplenty, but it, race isn't the number one thing. It's not going to work that well. So my stuff comes from interactional principles of human behavior. If you're having an interaction, what are the ways that bias shows up? So I've got a seven point framework for bias. So people like that. And so that's one of the things people come. They're like, we're trying to talk about stuff and either it doesn't work globally or people are getting angry or other people don't feel safe. Because in, in my experience, a lot of language of social justice is accurate, but doesn't land well with the people who are doing things. Even the term microaggression doesn't land well because people, it blocks people from taking accountability because they're like, I know I'm not being aggressive. So that answers that question. So question one, how do I get people to talk about bias in a way that is productive and accurate? Question two, and this comes from people leading different kinds of organizations within a company. How do I get people to stop saying bad things and harming my business? VP of talent acquisition. Oh my God, Suzanne, I just lost a, per a candidate that I really wanted. And guess what? The hiring manager kept on misgendering them. And so they said to me, and very often what you get is ghosted. The person who's been insulted, they're like, why am I going to take the time to educate you when you can't even be bothered to do the minimum of respect, the minimum of respect. So there was a very specialized position and this VP was really wanting to bring this person in for a senior director role. And they're like, sorry, I, I like if you can't be bothered, if your people can't be bothered to understand that there's more than two genders, how is this going to be a respectful workplace for me? Gone. It's just starting now. Salespeople are like, I heard that we tanked our deal because somebody said guys and guy and referred to somebody as he, but it turned out that the CTO was actually female. And so that was a $4 million deal and it's gone. So I guess my sales guys, guys is not great, but I guess my sales guys need training. People bring me in, heads of HR bring me in and they're like, my people managers don't know how to adjudicate disputes. And also my HR people, for example, I got brought in once for consulting and not training where a, a black director was being harassed by her VP. And it was very clearly racially motivated, but because the HR person involved 
did not have a sophisticated understanding of language and there were no racial slurs involved, that person wasn't able to effectively adjudicate and say, oh yes, this is harassment. And I was like, you're one step away from a lawsuit. All this person, I, I work with employment lawyers. I live with an employment lawyer. I know how cases are put together. And I'm always saying to my clients, I feel like I have a fiduciary responsibility to you to stop discrimination and harassment lawsuits in their tracks because the stuff you're bringing to me, it's called evidence and it's going to take time and they're going to do discovery and they're going to interview everybody. And it's so expensive and it's such a brand reputation hit and it'll make news. And all you have to do is just at the starting point, shut it down and fix things. Those are some of the people who bring me in. Basically it's depending on how well they know me, they might use curse words, but they're like, boy, my, I've been interviewing a lot of talent acquisition people right now for an article I'm writing about language candidates should avoid. So you're a young candidate, you're going to come in. What are some things that are turning into red flags when people are looking at you and saying, oh, red flag, this person assumed, this person said this, this person asked for coffee from the director who was going to interview them because she was female, all of these things. There are not that many stories about candidates and all the recruiters want to talk about is the hiring managers who have been causing problems. And we can't even get them in a room for a training. So a lot of people understand that problematic language is expensive and it's harming their business's bottom line and it's creating stress for them and it's creating problems. And they're like, what can you do to help me? And so that's what I do with either consulting or training or a combo of the both. That's excellent, Suzanne. And I want to thank you for the approach that you take. We were talking right before we started recording about you don't sidestep language. You put it front and center. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit what you mean by that, because it's important, especially as we're talking about how do we communicate more clearly and more intentionally at work? So there's a linguistic distortion that I like to talk about called softening language. So I don't like linguistic distortions because they mask reality. They cloud our mental models. They cause us to make less good judgments about things. So there's this linguistic distortion I call softening language. And this is when people use softer language to describe someone's behavior. And the way they describe it moves it from the zone of unacceptable or unreasonable or problematic or bad into the zone of acceptable. And so in my experience within companies, this is people high up in the organizational chart or people who belong to a lot of dominant groups. So here in the US, white people, male people, for the most, th that, that's for the most part. So if you've got a high ranking white guy sexually harassing somebody, you'll hear, oh, he's just really friendly, or that's how he is, or don't take it personally, or there are so many ways. Oh, they're just curious, people will say. Or yeah, she may sound harsh, but she just has high standards for somebody who's making, the lunch break is walking around the parking lot crying. So there's all this softening language that's used to distort reality. And what happens is then it's just like sweeping things under the rug and people make bad decisions. And I'm like, you gotta call it what it is. This person is engaging in toxic behavior. These are intrusive and unacceptable questions for a disabled person. This is sexual harassment. This is sexual harassment. This is sexual harassment. So this is what I'm talking about. Outside of the workplace, I work with journalists sometimes. And for them, the softening language happens most in terms of sexual assault and police violence. So the police will very often have people working on their behalf to spin things. So the syntax is so complicated that you can't tell if you undo it. So softening language can also be very complicated syntax. And so I've got examples in the book where I'm like, find this and rewrite it so you can start to see through the subterfuge or the clouding that people are doing. Because I think it feels so uncomfortable and so unpleasant when you feel like we're not we're not speaking the truth, especially when the truth is that things are going badly for some people because of bad behavior. And when people are just shoving it under the rug or pretending it's not real, I, I think this is one of the problems that people have with politicians and also with, I remember being on jury duty and I was grossed out by the behavior of both the district, the ADA, the assistant district attorney and the defense lawyer. I was like, just tell me what happened. Everything was pushing things in some direction and so manipulative. And there's a way in which we can feel it. Even if we're not thinking about it, we feel it. And I think it sits badly with us. So the only people who don't like it when we remove linguistic distortions are the people behaving badly. And my question is, are those the people you want to cater to? Or do you want to remove the person who's toxic or get their behavior in line? Because 
toxic people are expensive and they drive people away. And so many companies, I don't know about the companies you work with, but so many companies I work with are hemorrhaging money and they're not even tracking it. So they track their talent acquisition numbers and they don't track their talent retention numbers. And sometimes it takes an in-house head of DEI to be like, we're hemorrhaging underrepresented people. They're coming for three months, six months, a year, and then they're gone. And it was expensive for us to bring this, to bring them in. And so softening language is one of the ways that companies are deluding themselves out of how about how good a workplace they are providing for people and not even tracking their talent retention numbers. So you're nodding because you see it. I do. I hear all the time, we need to do a better job of recruiting diverse talent. Mm-hmm. And my question is always, Okay, first, let's talk about how are you keeping the talent you have that's underrepresented among your leadership ranks? Because we can put your money in a paper shredder, but that seems silly. Recruiting is expensive. Onboarding is expensive. Let's talk about how do we retain. Oh, our retention numbers are great. We got a an 85 whatever score on some, and we got the little badge. Okay, have you disaggregated that data? Because if 85% of your workforce is white and 85% of your workers are happy and there's 100% overlap between those two groups, this might be why you're not retaining talent like you need to be or why you need to think, why you think you need to recruit more. And there's always, I always know we're going to be in trouble when there's a lot of passive voice or when it's, it's the victim blaming construction of sentences. Back to your example, this many women were sexually assaulted. This many, this many people were severed from the company. No, you let them go. You force them out. That's a different conversation than they were severed. Like they just walked by and all of a sudden floated off into the ether. That's not what happened. So I appreciate very much the precision and the approach that you take to the language because how we frame things matters and it it creates accountability. And the thing that I'm finding is sticky. So I I had a, a book launch and people came to support me who are my friends So don't necessarily have an interest. They were like, oh, Suzanne wrote a book, let's come. And then it was very interesting to me what was sticky to them when they would talk to me later. And a bunch of people who are not specialists at all said to me, oh, this is a thing I didn't even know had come out of my mouth. But they were like, you said this interesting thing. I think it was terminological precision. You were like, a lot of people think that inclusive language is like pussyfooting around or being mealy mouthed or hiding or being whimsical or caving into the demands of oversensitive and histrionic people. But you were like, what I see is a lot of imprecise language and let's get precise. And so I've got these principles of inclusive language that are really about precision, prevent erasure. If you're erasing people, are people even getting written out of benefits or even for draw people in or incorporate other perspectives? I'll tell you that I've got stories about naming fields, so basic, but there's a thing that happens a lot when there's only two people from an underrepresented group, they'll often get called the other person's name. And I found out this was true even at the VP level. When I would do two people from South Asia, two women from South Asia, I thought by the time you're a VP, people are paying so much attention to you because we're so oriented towards power that you're they're going to get your names right No. Even at the VP level, if you're brown-skinned and female and with an unusual, a weird name, that's enough. I thought it was so interesting one time I was giving an inclusive language workshop to mostly tech managers. And so I was like, oh, it's disrespectful. And then I said the thing that they actually started taking out pens and writing down. They were like, I was like, okay, so you've got two people and they both report to you and they get called the other one's name all the time. How do you do performance reviews? Or how do you put somebody on a PIP? How do you know who's getting credit? How do you know who's doing the good work? How do you know who's saying the problematic stuff if you literally can't attribute it to the correct person? And then they started writing stuff down. So I was like, there's a real business outcome because what if people are like, oh, it was this one and not that one. It was Benedict and not Simu. And so you promote Benedict and it turns out it wasn't Benedict. It was Simu the whole time. Yeah, there are just lots and lots of ways that terminological precision benefits a company, benefits a team, benefits underrepresented people, because when you have clarity and you can delineate what's actually going on, then instead of the money in the paper shredder, or what I talk about is pouring money and uh, pouring, pouring money into a sieve. Like when you're recruiting underrepresented people and all your money goes into talent acquisition and none of it goes into workplace culture and talent retention. I'm like, just here's the colander and here, here's your money. Like you just pouring it right through. 
the more you have terminological precision, the more you can turn things that are invisible currently to a company that are a problem, they can make them visible. And once you accurately delineate a problem, then you can figure out how to solve it. But if the problem is shrouded in a cloud or you don't even know it exists, you're not going to do anything. And then you just repeat the same expensive patterns. So it's frustrating for, I'm like, all right, I'm like, you, you could be giving that money to me <laughs> to, to consult. I'm like, I'm watching that money go down the drain. They're like, we don't have a good budget. I'm like, because you're spending so much money re-recruiting people because you lost so many people. And the year that you lose a 200K a year engineer is the year you spend 300K because it's 50% on top of the salary to bring in a new person. Exactly. It's all about, it, it's not just being precise in the language, it's quantifying the problem as well. And knowing whom the problem affects. If we say people of color, but we really mean Latinas, we're missing out on how to solve the problem of retention. If we're talking about BIPOC employees, but we really mean Black men or Black women or Black employees broadly, it's a different set of solutions, a different set, a different way of framing it. And then we can be much more targeted in how we solve for, for the targets that we want to create. So Oh, I'm so glad that you're in this work, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Thank you for this book, which I know is going to be a great help um, to me and to other practitioners and to people outside who just want to be more respectful in their language. Where can people find you? What would you like for me to put in the show notes for people to find you if they want to work with you? The the easiest way to find me is through SuzanneWertheim.com. If you can figure out how to spell your name, my name, if you can figure out how to spell your name, if you can figure out how to spell my name, you can find me and then we'll figure out because there are people bring me in for keynotes, people bring me in for workshops and consulting. So we figure out if it's through me or through my company. And then it's also very handy for people to follow me on LinkedIn because I give away analyses, tips and tricks twice a month in my newsletter or I'll write posts that will sometimes go viral about topical things, usually in the US, but I'll give the scientific inclusive language analysis of something that's happened. And people again, find it very restful. They're like, oh, that's why people on the internet are paying so much attention to this basketball player. Like I didn't understand. Oh, it's inflating language. Oh, it's this linguistic distortion. Oh, okay. So LinkedIn, SuzanneWertheim.com. Very good. And if you can't spell SuzanneWertheim.com, you can go to includingupodcast.com and we will have all of the links there. Dr. Suzanne Wertheim, thank you so much for sharing your expertise uh, with me and with my audience. I appreciate you greatly. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a genuine delight to speak with you today. If you've enjoyed this episode, follow Lead at any level on LinkedIn and YouTube. Then join us for Including You video simulcast every Thursday at noon Eastern. Including You can also be enjoyed each week as part of the Living Corporate Audio Podcast Series, available on all major podcast platforms. Learn more at living-corporate.com. Including You is brought to you in part by Lead at Any Level, a boutique training and consulting firm improving employee engagement and retention for companies that promote from within. Lead at Any Level. Leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. Lead at Any Level and its logo are registered trademarks of Lead at Any Level LLC. The views and opinions of guests on our show do not necessarily reflect the positions of Lead at Any Level, Living Corporate, or the sponsors of Including You. That's it for this week's episode of Including You. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave us a review or a comment to help others find us as well. Be sure to join me next week when my guest will be Bianca Mays from Planned Parenthood.